Hey everyone, so we're going to talk about diseases of the posterior pituitary here. And uh, just sort of an overview of the posterior pituitary, it secretes ADH and oxytocin, and the hormones are made in the hypothalamus. And this stands in contrast to the anterior pituitary, where the hormones are actually made in the anterior pituitary, and they're triggered to be released by the hypothalamus via releasing hormones. So the posterior pituitary the, uh, is really just a conduit for hormones to come from the hypothalamus and then be released into the bloodstream uh, because of certain factors that the, hypothal or that the hypothalamus or posterior pituitary will pick up on. Uh, so they are very different uh, mechanisms, and they really are different tissue. All right, so the diseases of the posterior pituitary, while the posterior pituitary does secrete both ADH, antidiuretic hormone, otherwise known as vasopressin, and oxytocin, there's no real clinically significant diseases of oxytocin secretion. So the only diseases we're going to talk about are related to ADH. Uh, ADH is a hormone, antidiuretic hormone, is a hormone that promotes the preservation of water from the kidneys. So what ADH does is it promotes the insertion of aquaporins in the collecting duct, which is in the nephron, in the kidney. And aquaporins allow water to be reabsorbed from the hypertonic filtrate uh, that will eventually go to the urine. Remember, the collecting duct is sort of the last stage of the nephron. So the first thing we're going to talk about is syndrome of inappropriate ADH. And this is a syndrome where there's abnormally elevated ADH. So if we have abnormally elevated ADH, we're going to have a lot of these aquaporins because ADH promotes the insertion of these aquaporins on the collecting duct. If we have more of them, we're going to reabsorb more water. If we have more water being reabsorbed, then we're going to have more fluid in our bloodstream, which is going to mean a dilute uh, plasma, and we're going to have less fluid in the filtrate, meaning less fluid in the urine. So, um, the result of that is that it's going to be a decreased urinary volume because we're reabsorbing more fluid and a retention of fluid in the bloodstream. That's going to result in a decreased concentration of sodium and a decreased plasma osmolality. And that's just because there's more fluid. We're reabsorbing more fluid. It has nothing to do with sodium reabsorption. It has everything to do with water reabsorption. Both of the diseases of ADH have to do with water reabsorption because they're having to do with the aquaporins. So because we retain, we reabsorb that water, we're going to have a dilute plasma, meaning we're going to have hyponatremia and a low plasma osmolality. Okay, so this is a disease uh, marked by euvolemic hyponatremia. So you do have hyponatremia, meaning a low sodium, because you have excess water reabsorption, but you are euvolemic. The, the amount of water that's reabsorbed is not enough to make the patient become hypervolemic. So this is not hypervolemic hyponatremia. This is euvolemic hyponatremia. So these patients are not going to have ascites. They're not going to have edema. These will be normal-looking patients, but they will have hyponatremia, and in some cases, very severe hyponatremia. And like I said, it's due to high ADH levels. These patients can be asymptomatic, particularly if it's... Uh, if it's it, if it comes on really slowly. If it is a, uh, a, a quick elevation in ADH, then because they drop their sodium level so fast, the brain doesn't have time to adjust and they can develop neurological symptoms. The causes of SIADH are head trauma, malignancy, and certain drugs. Now you can think, which of these causes, oh, and meningitis, which of these causes of these four are going to be probably associated with more acute SIADH, and therefore symptoms? Well, it's probably going to be the things that come on more acutely, so head trauma and meningitis. Whereas malignancy and drugs that you take over a long period of time that 
that accumulate in your bloodstream, those will probably be more associated with the chronic forms of SIADH, so they'll, they'll be more likely to be asymptomatic. Now, just because it's asymptomatic doesn't mean you won't be able to diagnose it. It just means that you'll probably diagnose it coincidentally on the labs. So, like I said, often it's asymptomatic if it comes on slowly, but if it comes on more quickly, if, and if there are symptoms present, it will be due to the hyponatremia, and there'll be neurological symptoms. So it'll be things like headache, nausea, vomiting, uh, seizures, decreased level of consciousness, uh, and so forth. The diagnosis is going to be clinical, so it's going to be based on your labs. Uh, you're going to be getting, most importantly, you're going to be needing a CMP because you're going to need to know what your sodium level is and you're going to need to know your plasma osmolality. And then you'll need to have a urinalysis, of course, because uh, you need to know what your urine sodium is is, uh, and uh, what your, actually this should say urine osmolality, not urine sodium. Okay, so how do we know that the patient has SIADH? Well, we know that they've got a low plasma sodium. Uh, but what's going to happen is, okay, if a patient has a low plasma sodium, a low sodium concentration in their plasma, what should the kidneys normally be doing? They should be trying to reabsorb sodium. They should, they should be trying to reabsorb as much sodium as possible, and so therefore, they should have, the, the urine should have a very, 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 very low concentration of sodium, and that's because it should be trying to preserve as much sodium as it can. Now, in SIADH, the urine sodium will be inappropriately high, and it's going to be inappropriately high because fluid is being reabsorbed into the bloodstream. And so because we have an inappropriately high sodium, and the patient is hyponatremic, we know that that's disordered. If a patient is hyponatremic, they should have a low urinary sodium because the urine is how we kick things out of the body. So a, a high urinary sodium along with hyponatremia is consistent with SIADH. Um, so Generally, the definition of hyponatremia is 135 to 145, but uh, we're thinking more severe hyponatremia, so less than 130. It will usually be uh, somewhere in the 120s. And then the urine sodium is high if it's above 20 milliequivalents per liter. You should be given this on the USMLE. So the high urine sodium is due to the high urinary concentration, meaning a high water reabsorption, not due to a low sodium reabsorption. So this is all due to a fluid uh, a fluid reuptake abnormality it has nothing to do with sodium transporters or anything like that. So it's a urine sodium that's inappropriately high in the presence of hyponatremia. When the patient has hyponatremia, the urine sodium should always be low in normal patients. So this is how you clinically diagnose SIADH. You can also get an ADH level, but a lot of times the USMLE is going to want you to be able to diagnose this based on the patient's sodium level and based on the patient's urine sodium level and uh, osmolality. So asymptomatic patients can be treated with fluid restriction. If the patient's asymptomatic, it's not really a pressing issue and we just restrict their fluid and that's generally enough. Uh, to get their sodium level back up because, like I said, this is a disease of too much water reabsorption, not a disease of sodium reabsorption. So keeping them underneath 1.5 liters of uh, fluid per day. If that's not sufficient to bring their sodium back up into the normal range, 135 to 145, then you can put them on demeclocycline. Demeclocycline is a tetracycline antibiotic, but it is also a potent inhibitor of ADH. And so that can be used to bring patients back up into a normal natremic range. Now, if a patient is symptomatic, if they've got nausea or vomiting, if they've got head swelling, if they've got, if they have concurrent seizures or confusion or loss of consciousness, then it's going to be more important to get their sodium back up. And so what we're going to use is 3% uh, sodium chloride uh, IV. 
and you'll want to have serial sodium levels drawn uh, at least every hour when you start out and then maybe every two to four hours afterwards. And the reason for that is because we want to have an appropriate rate. Yes, we want to get the sodium levels back up in the patient, but we don't want to increase the plasma sodium level too quickly because that puts the patient at risk for centropontine myelinolysis, which is a devastating condition uh, and we don't want to go there. So uh, don't increase the plasma sodium level by more than 0.5 to 1 points per hour. After diagnosing this, once the patient is stable, controlled, you've treated the patient, then you want to start thinking about why it does the patient have SIADH. A lot of times it's due to drugs, a lot of times it's due to trauma, and you would know those things offhand, so you, you could probably uh, uh, make the, uh, make the, the uh, diagnosis based on, on that. I mean, you would, you would know that that's what it's due to, but if the patient doesn't have, isn't on any drugs that would cause SIADH, and the patient isn't, uh, doesn't have any trauma, then you're kind of wondering, well, is there another reason? And some of the other reasons are malignancies. And so we want to look for that. So the two malignancies that are very commonly associated with SIADH are small cell lung cancer and pancreatic cancer. So getting a chest x-ray, which is really cheap, or getting a uh, CT of the abdomen would be prudent to do just to check and see if there's any malignancies uh, that are, are presenting with SIADH. All right, so diabetes insipidus. So this is the exact opposite. Now here in diabetes insipidus, we have a low ADH or a low action of ADH. So this is a disease. On the other hand, whereas SIADH was too much water reabsorption, this is like absolutely no water reabsorption. So all the fluid is just going to pour out uh, through the urine. And so this is a disease marked by polyuria, polydipsia, and often hypernatremia. Now, another thing that's going to set this apart is that the patient is going to have nocturia or enuresis even. And the reason that it sets it apart is some people just drink a lot of water and they don't connect that to the fact that, oh, I'm peeing a lot because I'm drinking a lot of water. Now, at nighttime, you shouldn't be waking up having to go to the bathroom because you aren't drinking water when you're sleeping. Uh, so nocturia is something that more specifically could point you towards diabetes insipidus. Now there's two kinds of diabetes insipidus. There's central diabetes insipidus and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So in central diabetes insipidus, there's some sort of lesion in the brain, either at the hypothalamus uh, or in the uh, posterior pituitary. Now there are osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus that respond to when you have a high plasma osmolality, it releases ADH uh, to uh, try to allow you to uh, reabsorb water and therefore uh, reduce your plasma osmolality back down to a normal range. If those are disordered, then you're going to have a low ADH and that's like a central uh, diabetes insipidus. So in the case of central diabetes insipidus, the problem is indeed a low ADH. So we don't have any ADH in these patients to, to, to function, or not enough ADH in these patients to function to reabsorb enough water, and so that's why they're peeing out so much. Now there's also nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, and in the case of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, it's not really a hormonal problem. The problem is actually due to the receptors. And so the problem with nephrogenic diabetes insipidus is that the kidneys aren't responding to the ADH. The, uh, the, the, the hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary are secreting ADH just fine, but the kidneys aren't responding to it. And what can actually happen is uh, that because this is going to lead, diabetes insipidus is going to lead to such a vast amount of fluid loss, and therefore it's going to raise your plasma osmolality uh, because the, the serum is going to become concentrated, you can actually get a really high amount of ADH in these patients just because you've, you're losing negative feedback. Uh, and so 
patients with nephrogenic diabetes insipidus may indeed have a high ADH, a normal or high ADH. It's just that their kidneys aren't responding to the ADH. Kind of analogous to how patients with hypothyroidism have a high TSH despite the fact that they've got uh, hypothyroidism. Either way, central and, or nephrogenic diabetes insipidus are clinically identical. So what are the causes of central diabetes insipidus? Most frequently, it's going to be trauma or tumor. So head trauma or a malignant or benign brain tumor make up about the majority of cases. And I will say that patients with head trauma or tumor, they may have signs of anterior pituitary hormone loss, and so they may have signs of thyroid deficiency, they may have signs of adrenal insufficiency, they may have signs of gonadal insufficiency, and so that's something to think about. Uh, you may see some of the posterior pituitary diseases, particularly diabetes insipidus, presenting with uh, anterior pituitary diseases as well, uh, because trauma and tumor can cause posterior pituitary diseases in addition to anterior pituitary diseases. Approximately 25% of diabetes insipidus cases are idiopathic, and those tend to present in childhood. The other 25% come from other causes, uh, such as oxygen deficiency, meningitis, uh, radiation, and so forth. As far as nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, they tend to be caused by drugs. Lithium, which is commonly used for bipolar disorder, can cause diabetes insipidus. Demeclocycline can cause diabetes insipidus. Remember, demeclocycline is what we use to treat SIADH. Uh, so you can see how if you're giving that to somebody for, for instance, a bacterial infection, uh, which would be another use of demeclocycline, you could cause them to not respond to their ADH because this is an inhibitor of ADH. Alcohol is also an inhibitor of ADH, but usually people aren't on that all the time. Um, hypercalcemia, hypokalemia, infiltrative diseases which affect the posterior or which affect the kidney, uh, and Sjogren's syndrome can also affect the uh, the kidney as well. So these are all causes of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So you may be asking yourself, how do you tell these apart? Uh, and so here's the comparison. We'll come back to that. So the question, is, uh, what you, you, you'll want to ask yourself is how you tell these apart. However, first, what you should uh, be aware of is if the patient is, uh, so if they have these if they have these symptoms, polyuria, polydipsia, nocturia, and uresis, and so forth, um, if they have a, a low blood pressure because they're losing fluid, if they have any symptoms related to low blood pressure or low fluid status, altered mental status, loss of consciousness, the first step on the USMLE is always going to be to uh, start hypotonic fluids or start any kind of fluids whatsoever uh, to restore the patient's fluid status. If the patient's hypernatremic, the best first step, uh, regardless of symptoms, the best first step is going to be to start hypotonic uh, fluids, so D5 and water. Uh, and uh, you're going to target your correction for sodium at approximately 0 0.5 milliequivalents per hour. Again, you don't want to correct the sodium too fast either way. Certain labs that you're going to need to order are going to be CMP, UA, and plasma ADH. So for your CMP, you're going to be looking at your sodium level, your plasma osmolality. For your uh, your analysis, you're going to be looking at your urinary sodium and your urine osmolality, and then your plasma ADH. Your plasma ADH often can tell you whether it's central diabetes insipidus, in which you'd have a low plasma ADH, or if it's nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, where you'd have a normal or elevated plasma ADH. However, the USMLE is going to want you to know a different way to be able to tell you the, tell, tell the difference apart from central and nephrogenic, and I'll explain that in a little bit. So the diagnosis is clinical. Like I said, a lot of times you can diagnose it just simply based on the CMP, on the urinalysis. But one thing I will say is that you should definitely look at the glucose level in the CMP. Why? Because diabetes mellitus can present as polyuria, polydipsia, and nocturia. Uh, the difference between diabetes insipidus and diabetes mellitus is that uh, 
in patients with diabetes mellitus, the plasma glucose level is going to be very elevated, whereas in diabetes insipidus, it should be normal. Okay, so the diagnosis is clinical. There is a test that can be done to formally diagnose diabetes insipidus, and that's a water deprivation test. And all we're doing with the water deprivation test is we're taking multiple measurements comparing the plasma osmolality to the urine osmolality, and it's taken while the patient does not drink water. And of course, this is done in the hospital in a supervised environment. So here's a water deprivation test. So a water deprivation test, what we're doing is we're not letting the patient have any water, and every hour or so, we're going to measure their plasma osmolality and measure their urine osmolality. And remember, these patients are going to be peeing a lot, so it's not going to be difficult to get urine from them. Once you st when you start, uh, so in a normal person, let's start out with a normal person. In a normal person, when they stop drinking water, what happens is their plasma osmolality goes up. And as their plasma osmolality goes up, their urine osmolality should go up too. Because if you're not drinking water, you should have less water in your urine. That makes perfect sense. Because if you're not drinking any fluid, you shouldn't be peeing it out. And so here we see as the plasma osmolality goes up, the urine osmolality is going up with it. That's normal. That's good. In diabetes insipidus, you're not drinking water, and so your plasma osmolality is going up but you continue to urinate dilute urine because your the fluid is just pouring out of the urine. And so you've got a really flat curve here. The plasma osmolality goes up, but the urine osmolality is not really responding. It's staying kind of the same. And so the result of that is that your plasma osmolality is going to go up a lot faster. Now, how can you tell the difference without drawing ADH levels, just by doing a water deprivation test uh, between di uh, diabetes insipidus that's central and diabetes insipidus that's nephrogenic. All you have to do is give the patient ADH while you're doing a water deprivation test. A patient who has central diabetes insipidus, they just don't have any ADH in their bloodstream. If they had ADH, they'd be fine. Patients with nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, they have ADH, but they can't respond to it. And so in a patient with central diabetes insipidus, when you give them ADH, they should respond and come back to normal, uh, or close to normal at least. In a patient with nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, even though you give them ADH, they're still going to have the nephrogenic diabetes insipidus-like curve. And so by giving the patient ADH, you can then tell whether the patient has central diabetes insipidus or nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. You can also tell, though, by, uh, by just looking at the plasma ADH levels. But you should know how to tell uh, central from nephrogenic by either the ADH levels or by uh, the water deprivation test. Okay, so how do we treat diabetes insipidus? So for central diabetes insipidus, the treatment is pretty straightforward. These are patients that don't have ADH, uh, or they're, they're not secreting ADH. So what do we do? We give them something that's like ADH, and uh, that is a synthetic form of ADH known as DDAVP. It's also known as desmopressin. That can be given intranasally, and uh, that will treat the disease. For nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, it's a little more complicated because they're not responding to ADH, and so we need some way of getting them to uh, to keep their sodium levels uh, keep their sodium levels down in the normal range. And so the best thing we can do for these patients is give them hydrochlorothiazide and or amylaride. And you might be thinking, what the heck? Why are we giving patients who are peeing too much uh, hydrochlorothiazide, which is a diuretic? And here's the reason. The symptoms, the problems for patients with diabetes insipidus, while, this, while diabetes insipidus is a disease of, the, of, of uh, ADH and it's a disease of water, uh, not of sodium, the symptoms come from a high plasma sodium. And so we want to prevent that plasma sodium from ever going up if we can. And one of the things that we can do is give them hydrochlorothiazide, which remember, is as a, as a diuretic, it blocks the reabsorption of sodium uh, in the kidneys. And so this will help uh, with keeping the patient's sodium levels down in the normal range. Uh, 
even though in addition to the medical therapy, you're still going to want these patients to be keeping their fluid intake uh, at, at a generous amount. So hydrochlorothiazide and or amylaride are both uh, perfectly fine uh, drugs. Uh, usually amylaride is, uh, would be an add-on. Uh, amylaride is a potassium sparing diuretic and the reason is because hydrochlorothiazide uh, can uh, drop your potassium levels so you may have to add amylaride to keep the patient's potassium levels in balance too because if you're giving the patient hydrochlorothiazide uh, yes that will keep your sodium levels intact but it may do so also at the expense of serum potassium so you may need to add amylaride on there so even though this sounds paradoxical and even if you don't really understand the mechanism or don't want to understand the mechanism just make a commitment to memory that nephrogenic diabetes insipidus is treated the best medical therapy is hydroxy or hydrochlorothiazide uh, and or amylaride while the patient's in the hospital, uh, if you're giving them D5W, uh, you should be monitoring them for hyponatremia since it's very easy to drop them from hypernatremia to hyponatremia really quickly. You shouldn't be dropping their, uh, your, their blood sodium that quickly, no more than 0 0.5 to 1 uh, uh, point per hour, but uh, you should be getting electrolyte panels at least every 4 to 6 hours. And 24-hour urine levels should also be ordered. And you can discharge the patient once uh, a cause has been determined and their electrolytes are stable and you've figured out an appropriate treatment plan. So just to review, diabetes insipidus, the causes are generally head trauma or tumor or idiopathic, which would be in childhood. Uh, symptoms uh, are, and, and I would add that there are some drugs particularly uh, some of the vinca alkaloids can cause diabetes insipidus. Uh, the symptoms are polyuria, polydipsia, nocturia, and this uh, can be either due to a low ADH level, which would be central, or just a decreased response. The result is going to be a high urine vol volume, which causes the polyuria and the polydipsia, and a loss of plasma volume, which causes the increased plas plasma osmolality and the increased sodium concentration. The treatment is DDAVP for central and uh, the hydrochlorothiazide plus or minus amylaride for uh, nephrogenic. And then for, if the patient's hypernatremic while they're in the hospital, you're going to start a D5W line and check their plasma sodium levels because you don't want them to go down more than half to one point per hour. For SIADH, the causes are generally head injury, malignancy, drugs. There's a long list of drugs that can cause SIADH. Uh, the symptoms, there might be none, or they could present with uh, symptoms of hyponatremia, which would be nausea, vomiting, seizures, altered mental status. The problem here is always going to be elevated ADH, which is going to cause high reabsorption of water. That's going to mean low urine volume since you're reabsorbing water, which is going to mean a uh, increased urine uh, sodium. Since it's a low urine volume, it's going to be an increased urine concentration of sodium. The absolute urine sodium is going to still be the same, but the urine concentration of sodium is going to be high because there's less water in the urine. There's going to be a retention of fluid in, uh, in the uh, plasma, and so you're going to have a decreased concentration of sodium. Your absolute sodium is going to be the same, but your concentration of sodium is going to be low. Uh, because there's more fluid in the plasma, and you're going to have a decreased plasma osmolality. Treatment for SIADH, if the patient is emergent, meaning they have symptoms, then you're going to treat them with 3% sodium chloride. Do not increase their sodium levels by more than 0 0.5 to 1 point per hour, uh, because you could cause central pontine myelinolysis. On a chronic basis, you're going to be giving, uh, you're going to have the patient on fluid restriction, uh, Try to keep it below 1.5 liters per day, and demeclocycline, uh, which is an inhibitor of ADH, and remember that could be a cause of diabetes insipidus. And that is it.